Good morning, members of parliament, support staff, visitors in the public tribune, radio listeners, TV viewers, those viewing via social media, and members of the media. Welcome to the Central Committee meeting number 13 of today, Friday, February 24, 2023. We have established a quorum of nine members. Today, exactly February 24th, marks one year with the Ukraine war. Let's have world peace in a moment of silence. Please stand for a moment of silence. Thank you. I have received notice of absence from the following members. MP Angelic Rumu, notifications, before we go to any notifications, tomorrow is February 25th and our Secretary General Garrick's birthday. Yay. So I would take this opportunity to wish him an advanced birthday for a happy and healthy life. <laughs> notifications, I see MP Emmanuel. MP Emmanuel, you have the floor. Good morning to all my honorable colleagues, everyone in the Tribune. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, our Khifrid and the people of St. Martin, by whichever means they are watching and viewing this meeting here this morning. Mr. Chairman, I want to congratulate and thank the St. Martin Academy. Why am I saying that? I was on Facebook last night, and the reel came up with the young girls and their Afro that they had in school. They actually had a Afro day in school. I'm saying this because we have come a long way because it was taboo for young black girls to actually sport their natural hair in the schools. We still have it today where the hair is looked down upon, especially if they go in with dreadlocks and all those sort of things. And when I saw it, 
when I saw it last night, where they had an Afro day, and all the young girls and the boys were showing their natural Afro and their hair, and sporting their natural hair, I was like, baby steps, but at least now we are seeing that we have come a certain distance where we as colored people are offered the opportunity to wear our natural hair in schools without being looked upon or without being any sort of derogatory terms being labeled at it. So I just want to congratulate the school for that. We have a lot more to go as well, but I think it's a step in the right directions for our young people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Emanuel. I see MP Sarah Westcott Williams. MP Sarah, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good morning. Good morning to all. Good morning to my colleagues. Good morning to you. Good morning to all tuned in to this meeting of parliament, this central committee meeting of parliament. Mr. Chairman, the reason why we are sitting here at 11, actually we were supposed to start at 11, is due to the fact that a 10 o'clock public meeting of parliament that was scheduled at least for 10 o'clock this morning was postponed, in fact was canceled, and thus this meeting that was supposed to be at 2 p.m. was put to 11 a.m. Nothing wrong with that change. My focus is on the cancellation of the 10 o'clock public meeting. Mr. Chairman, you would recall that that meeting was a continuation of an urgently requested meeting. In fact, the meeting was requested on a Thursday, I believe it was, and by the Monday, not only did we have it on schedule, we also had the, we also had the minister's confirmation that they would be present. They were. Questions were asked in the meeting, and the and the ministers had to return today. According to our schedule of convocations, the ministers, both ministers, had confirmed for the 10 o'clock meeting this morning in terms of, not in terms of, this meeting was about a continuation of the meeting pertaining to the preservation of monuments, ruins, etc., etc. that urgent meeting. With the cancellation came a email from the Minister of Education, Culture, Youth and Sport that due to unforeseen circumstances, the minister could not make this meeting. No further indication when the minister could make the meeting, if the minister will make the meeting, nor was anything heard from the minister of Romi, who had also, according to our listing, confirmed for the meeting. I hope that albeit that this is a notification that Mr. Chairman, you could help me make sense from that. If you could help me make sense and understand what transpired here, I would be most grateful. So Mr. Chairman, I also want to extend advanced birthday greetings to our Secretary General Garrick and wish him all the best on his day tomorrow, as well as success, health, go um, in the coming years. Wishing him many more years, and in those years, much success, good health, and uh, joyful years ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Westcott Williams. I would like to give the floor to MP Grisha Heiliger Martin. A pleasant good morning to you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to my fellow colleagues, and good morning to those listening and viewing online, and good morning to our person in the Tribune. Good morning, Miss. Mr. Chairman, um, I wanted to do a follow up with you, Mr. Chairman, regarding a meeting that we requested in November of 2022 for TELEM. It also has been an urgent meeting that we requested since November, and to date we have yet to hear when this meeting will be um, posted on the convocations. Um, it's been, what, November, December, January, February, three months in waiting, a, a urgent public meeting regarding the TELEM group of companies, and we'd like to know when we can see that on the schedule. 
looking forward to a response from you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, MP Grisha Halligo Martin. Um, both the queries, I will look into it and get back to you before the meeting ends. Are there any other notifications? I don't see any need. The agenda point for this Central Committee meeting is Initiative National Ordinance amending the cinema regulation in connection with the amendment of the duties, composition, tenure, and other changes of the vetting. Parliamentary year 2014-15-079. We go over to the agenda point. One of the most basic rights of members of parliament is the right of initiative. According to the Article 85 of the Constitution, a member of parliament has the right to submit a draft initiative national ordinance to parliament for handling and approval. Today we have one agenda point before us. This agenda point will be dealing with the draft initiative national ordinance. On August 19, 2015, the Parliament of St. Martin received the draft initiative national ordinance amending the cinema regulation in connection with the amendment of the duties, composition, tenure, and other changes to the vetting. This draft initiative national ordinance was submitted by then Member of Parliament, Ms. Tamara E. Leonard. As prescribed by Article 69, Paragraph 3 and 85, Paragraph 3 of the Constitution, the draft was sent to the Council of Advice for Advice. On November 4, 2015, Parliament received the advice from the Council of Advice. The next step in the process was a reaction to this advice. On November 24, 2022, MP Rolando Bryson indicated to Parliament by letter registered under IS 242-22-23 that he, MP Bryson, on behalf of the United People's Party, to which former MP Tamara Leonard was a member at the time of submission of the draft, intend to take over this draft initiative national ordinance. MP Bryson, in, do, in so doing, became the initiative taker. On February 2, 2023, MP Bryson submitted the reaction to the advice, and on that same date, he submitted an amendment draft based on the advice of the Council of Advice. These documents are registered under IS 413-2022-23 and IS 412-2022-23, respectively. MP Bryson, as the initiative taker of this law, will be the one defending it today. For good order's sake, the following. The Central Committee meeting will follow the same procedures as any other Central Committee meeting, with the exception that instead of a minister, MP Bryson, the initiative taker, will be interacting with the other members of parliament and answering their questions. All members of parliament have received all necessary docu documentation pertaining to this agenda point. I will give the floor to MP Bryson first to give some introductory remarks. MP Bryson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to you. Good morning to the Secretary General, and I also would like to say a happy advanced birthday greeting uh, to the honorable members of parliament. Uh, good morning to you. Good morning to uh, those viewing. Uh, I know several teachers, parents, and others within the Tribune and following by various media. Good morning to all of you. Uh, it is a distinct pleasure and honor to be before the members of parliament today, Mr. Chairman, to present a, an amendment to the cinema ordinance. Um, as you have described in your, in your introductory remarks, it was a national ordinance amendment that was um, initiated by member of parliament Tamara Leonard, um, as you described, after consulting with various key party members and former members of parliament. We looked at the legislation and we think that today, uh, not only does it still have merit, it may have uh, even more so than at the time when MP Leonard had envisioned the need to make adjustments to the cinema ordinance. So for that reason, um, we have 
taken it upon ourselves as a faction to uh, take into consideration as much as possible the advice from the Council of Advice, uh, make some amendments and uh, adjustments to the original draft from MP Tamara Leonard. And today I would like to do a presentation um, that can give a bit of a background on the actual legislation, so the cinema ordinance and what it actually entails, um, highlight some of the key changes that the law intends to introduce. Um, we go over some of the remarks from the council advice and in what manner they have been addressed. And then of course, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to the opportunity from the honorable members of parliament to pose any questions or comments or suggestions related to this uh, initiative legislation. First, uh, background and uh, information about the current law. Um, to start, I want to give uh, some important context as dealing with this legislation. Uh, it is a cinema ordinance that was created uh, since 1978 um, in the Netherlands Antilles that apply to all the islands within the Netherlands Antilles. Um, and it has been uh, very barely modified, so to speak, since that time. Um, so as we describe certain things within this legislation, it might maybe come across a little, a little strange or antiquated, um, but that may also really highlight why there are some changes needed to the legislation. So the cinema ordinance, like I mentioned, the current version of the cinema ordinance was created to regulate cinema viewing in the Netherlands Antilles. Um, at the time, there was not a very popular, let's say, international rating system like we have now. The Mo Motion Picture Association actually introduced their G through R rating system in 1972, so it was still in its infancy. And the law was created to create some sort of rating system to screen the content of movies that are displayed uh, publicly and available to the public by means of public displays and cinemas. After not many amendments over the years, the law was taken over as a national ordinance uh, with 101010 and hence is now the National Cinema Ordinance. In 2015, MP Tamara Leonard started, uh, started studying the law and uh, finding various issues with it, having stakeholder consultations, speaking to the movie theater, parents, and others to investigate possible uh, amendments to this law. In 2022, the UP faction has uh, since modified the law after doing some additional legal reviews and consulting with other legal professionals and incorporating where possible the Council of Advice's recommendations. So what does the cinema ordinance actually do? Um, there are four main things that we can identify that the cinema ordinance does. Uh, first of all, it really defines a movie in the context of a movie theater. So it defines public cinema performances that is translated, so what we will call a movie. They specifically make a distinction to a movie that is displayed to the public in a movie theater. So that also delineates that it does not apply, for example, to movies that uh, you watch on television or on your, and now in this day and age, on your phones even. It is specifically intended for those movies that are broadcasted by movie theaters. Uh, the law also introduced or sets a fee and a permit requirement uh, for each individual broadcast or, or for each showing per individual movie based on the number of times it is intended to be broadcasted. Uh, the law also implements a, has, has instituted since 1978 a cinema commission uh, where that no movie can be displayed in a theater by law without first being vetted by this commission. And also, um, this commission also has a, a sort of an inspection right where the commission is able to give a rating after having viewed it, and at that point, then the movie is allowed to be displayed in St. Martin. Just to go over some of the nuances within the law itself, um, Article 1, Paragraph 1, where it states, it is prohibited to undertake public cinema performances or to give one or more public performances unless the minister of ECYS has granted a written permission for this. So that talks about the definition. In Article 14, it uh, outlines the commission itself, that there's a committee for judging films, the composition, the fact that there's a chairman and a secretary. What is important to note here is that the current and existing law um, uh, has everyone appointed on an indefinite period. It does not state any, um, let's say, period, which is typical in most boards, that they would be for a certain term. Um, there's, there's also, as the council advice noted, there is no clear legal basis or legal route for dismissal of members 
um, as it does not explicitly state that this is done by national decree. Only the appointment is done by national decree. Article 18 says that no films would be shown in public unless and insofar as they have been allowed for public screening by the selection committee as, as not contrary to good morals and public order. This also has a sort of an additional function other than, let's say, the age categories that you see, um, but there could also be a determination by the committee that a, a movie in general um, n being contrary to good morals and public order um, could also be forbidden from being screened altogether, so they do have that competency. And Article 23 actually has a penal provision um, where um, the failure, let's say, for example, of the movie theater to comply with certain laws. Um, as the Radvan Advis had remarked, this, is, this seems pretty heavy-handed and would normally be, in other legislation, more of an administrative penalty. Um, but in 1978, the legislators had used this penal provision instead. Now, commonly, most of us are very familiar with what you see here, which is the cinema, the, the normal rating system, the G, P, G, P, G, 13, and R. And the intention behind this um, rating system is G through P, G, 13, the rating system cautions the, especially parents, about the viewing of it. So G, all, all ages admitted. Um, P, G, they still, parents are urged to give parental guidance, um, but, the, but um, yes, so parental guidance. Parents are urged to be cautious in PG-13, and even in rated R movies, under 17 requires accompanying parent or adult. So they caution very heavily about the adult material of it, but that if a child under 17 was to view the movie, that they, must be, they should be accompanied by a parent or an adult. This differs greatly from our uh, rating system in the cinema ordinance, you can see it's broken down into persons, well, the G is the same, all persons, but then you also have persons over the age of 14, then there's a distinction for a gap of 16, and then they actually talk about per persons over the age of 18. So it may juxtapose a little bit to PG, PG-13, and R, um, but what we've seen in practice is that many movies that traditionally are said to be uh, allowable with parental guidance, especially PG-13 movies, um, if they are given a rating of B, uh, no one under the age of 14 is allowed to watch it, even with parental guidance, based on the way the, the current law is set up. In doing some research about, about this, uh, in terms of the merit of PG-13 movies and them being accessible to um, younger audiences with parental guidance, uh, we can see that there are some examples of inspirational-themed movies that, within the current law, uh, a minor, even with their parents' permission, would not be able to see, like The Great Debaters, Freedom Writers, A Beautiful Mind. There's also many sports themes movies, especially for young children that are aspiring to be in sports. Some of these movies can have some content that might see, you know, the, the, the coaches being rough with them and so on, so it may seem that it has a PG-13 rating, but some parents may want their children to watch some of these sports movies like Coach Carter, Moneyball, and Glory Road. But of course, very commonly, not necessarily in the theme of educational or inspirational, but you also have very common superhero movies. And while that doesn't have a sort of an inspirational aspect to it, um, there is a social and cultural component and a family component where many children want to be able to watch these movies with their family and their children. Um, but here you have some examples of some like very popular Black Panther, you know, and more recently Wakanda Forever, that was rated PG-13. Um, but a 12-year-old would not, or a 13-year-old even, would not be permitted to watch it, even with the permission and guidance of their parents. But one thing that is important to have for proper context today is that children can have access all day to all kinds of media. Um, you see some examples of TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat. The cinema ordinance doesn't protect children from that. And I think um, parental guidance is so important, not just in what we allow our children to see in the theater, but even more so on their iPads, on their computers, on their phones. Um, parental guidance is a very important aspect of protecting children and guiding them to understand the content of what they're watching. Another aspect of the cinema ordinance that is important to note is that there's a fee structure, and I want to stress that this is not the fee or the price of the ticket that goes to, con to customers. That is not regulated in this law. What is regulated is a fee for the permit and the permission for a movie to display a showing. 
Most commonly, although it's broken down in various categories, most commonly what you see is that the movie would show for 16 or more times. They would pay 100 guilders per movie. So for example, using uh, Wakanda Forever as an example, let's say they display that 20 times in a month, they would pay 100 guilders. So that's approximately five guilders per month per movie, which one movie ticket would actually cover. Um, Keeping in mind also that 100 guilders in 1978 is actually, if you use inflation, would actually be a value of 453 guilders today. So what does the current law propose to address? Well, definitely this evolution and impact of theater films and whether there is still a need comparing to 1978 to 2023, the way the accessibility to multimedia has evolved. In 1978, the theater was still the most popular way to watch movies. Um, even common things that we know today, like HBO, HBO actually started on national te television in its, in its infancy only in 1975. So, and it didn't grow to mainstream popularity until the late 80s and early 90s. So throughout those years, at least a decade, the theaters were still the most dominant place that people would watch movies. So it would probably have made sense back then where there would be so much more stringent um, need for a sort of evaluation committee to be the final decider as to what can and cannot be viewed by children. Also, at that time, the international rating system from the Motion Picture Association had just been introduced. This was now in 1972, so it was also still in its infancy and gaining popularity. Uh, today, we, in 2023, we know that media is available everywhere. People have access not just to movies, but also all sorts of content on Netflix, YouTube, TikTok, etc. And also, parents have a better understanding of international rating systems, so everyone is very familiar with G, PG, and PG-13. And they also have online resources like Internet Movie Database, where there's a section within most movies where you can view and get an advice on you know, what the content of the movie is from a child perspective. And like I mentioned earlier, in 2023, 100 guilders is actually valued now at 453 guilders. So that is also a significant change between then and now. So one of the changes being proposed is an adjustment to the Cinema Com Commission. Um, there is a new term limit introduced in 16 paragraph one, which will be a maximum term of five years. There's also a sort of qualification clause where um, they are selected based on social um, competencies. So there, there should be some sort of resume where they have social slash cultural experience. The size of the commission in 14 uh, 2C has been limited to nine instead of uh, 15 members. And the Elbe function, so the sort of national decree appointment has been clarified in 14.3 to also be that they are appointed and dismissed by national decree. And then there's a return clause uh, because we, we do think that it may be an option where someone uh, serves for five years, but there is a need to reappoint people. Um, there is an opportunity with a two year gap to be reappointed. So why this, this change to the cinema Commission, in discussing with the initiative, the original initiative taker, as well as our faction, um, first of all, we don't think that any boards should be for an indefinite period. There should be opportunities for others to serve in such semi-public functions. Um, and ensuring that someone has some social and cultural affinity will help in the screening of movies. The commission size has a budgetary implication as this is a paid function, so perhaps adjusting the size can help with that as well. And the government should have a say in the appointment and dismissal of members by national decree. So those why, that, is, that summarizes why those changes are proposed in this law. Regarding the fees, while yes, there has been no increases for a very long time, we did also have to try to be some sort, some, a bit of a middle ground to not say, well, we'll just directly index it based on inflation and raise it from 100 guilders to 453 guilders. So in discussion, uh, with the initiative taker and our faction and other advisors, it was advised to do a 75% increase, which would increase all of the figures as you see uh, in the original cost, let's say five guilders for one showing to 875, but in the most common category, 100 guilders would now be 175. 
Again, I would like to reiterate that if you show a movie 20 times in a month, you pay 175 guilders. That's approximately eight guilders and 75, per month, uh, 75 cents per month per movie, which still just one viewer is able to cost. Because we, of course, understand that it is a sharp increase. We do not want to cause a sort of a, a inflationary effect on ticket prices, but I do not think this increase does that. And I also do think that it's important um, that as members of parliament or anyone bringing laws that we also look at opportunities for government to be able to increase its revenues. So this does address that aspect. So as I said, the fees are still really low and um, the, even taking the inflation into account, we didn't make such a sharp jump. We increased it by 75%. And like mentioned, we should definitely seek more opportunities to, fees, to increase fees responsibly and gradually, especially those that have remained untouched for many years. Now, a very important aspect of the change um, is regarding parental permission to allow a child to watch a movie that is higher than the so-called rated age. And I say rated because, again, a lot of people, we commonly just use the internationally known rating system of G, PG, and PG-13 when uh, accounting for what children should view. Um, what we have done is added as follows. I'll just read the English version. It is, this would be in, um, it is an amendment to article 18 sub four, which says the following. It is up to the parents or guardians who are accompanied by children under the age of 18 to decide whether they wish to visit a public cinema screening with these children if a film will be shown during that screening that has been deemed inadmissible by the Cinema Commission for children of that age group. Basically what this is doing is that the commission sort of becomes a sort of a secondary, uh, an evaluator with the primary decision as to the content of films being left up to the parent. There is also a sort of reverse function here where sometimes you have the local commission that may determine that something is adequate for children, um, but a parent may decide on their own, having looked at the content of it, might say, you know what, this is not something that I would like to view. So now there brings a sort of a balance that ultimately the parental responsibility is put at the forefront for them to determine whether a child is able to watch any of those movies within the movie theater. So why this change? Again, parental guidance, we believe, should be at the forefront of deciding what children should watch. Um, this, I think, is something not just for movie theaters, but something that we should probably uh, think about as, as people within our country across the board, with how fast media is available and, and can be exposed to our children. Um, parental guidance, I believe, in general, should always be at the forefront. Um, and not only, let's say, relying on any rating system being a local one or an international one. The cinema ordinance was designed to mitigate things at the time when the theater was the most prominent form of media. So again, highlighting the fact that there are many other um, media availabilities that we unfortunately cannot legislate to protect. Some movies that are PG-13 do have some learning opportunities and social bonding opportunities for parents and children. And very important to note, the law does not just give, this amendment does not give a blanket approval for a child to just watch any of the higher rated movies on their own. The parents not, uh, um, sorry, children, I made a mistake there, children not accompanied by an adult will still not be able to watch movies on their own. So that still remains the case and could perhaps serve as a sort of incentive for uh, children that want to watch their favorite movie that they do so and are encouraged to talk to their parents about it and get the permission to go with their parents or, or, or the designated adult to watch said movie. Regarding the Council of Advice, um, Mr. Chairman, having gone through um, several legislative processes, I've always stated that the Council of Advice is a very important part, especially as an initiative taker where we don't have let's say entire legal departments behind us and so on. We do are given some resources from the Secretary General or we hire our own to be able to draft legislation. But the Council of Advice serves as a great guidance in members of parliament on how we can legislate. So I believe it's very important to every extent possible to look at what the Council of Advice has said 
and how we apply it within the legislation. To summarize some of the findings from the Council of Advice, compared to the original legislation that was brought forward, um, there was some concerns of the fact that they're outside of the, uh, or under the cinema ordinance, there's also a national decree containing general measures that is in line with the cinema ordinance. And one of the findings from the Council of Advice is that they were advising to ensure as much as possible to ensure that the changes that we make are in line and can still be, that, that don't interfere so much with the delegation authority given by national decree um, containing general measures. Also, um, the Council of Advice did note in terms of that the penal code stipulates that children should be protected from harmful images. So they, of course, in, that is a natural thing that we have to consider that there is a legal responsibility for all children to be protected from what is defined as harmful images. Um, they also had some concerns about the composition and how changes in the first composition that was being proposed at the time by MP Leonard. Um, the costs, they also mentioned, you know, in terms of the sharp increase, is that something sustainable? Is that something that is too difficult for the movie theater to handle? And they also made asked for some considerations in terms of making this a, rather than being a penal provision, so we mentioned like the penal code earlier, they also do account that maybe this type of thing should not be regulated as a penal provision, but instead as an administrative enforcement. So how did we address those concerns? Regarding the, the concern about the cinema El Beham, to address that concern, the draft law will be kept in line with the existing El Beham as much as possible. So for example, the position of secretary and chairman as recommended by the, by the Council of Advice has been included in the draft again. In the original version from MP Leonard, that was removed, but some, those observations were made and we reintroduced it in the final draft that's before you today. Addressing the concern regarding the cost and fee system, the council questions about the fees is, has been considered the fact is, however, that St. Martin has only had one movie theater for a long time, and these rates have remained largely unchanged during that time. If we use an inflation calculator, $1 in 1978 is $4.57 today, an increase of 357%. An increase of 75% is therefore much lower than inflation to compare with price increases. Although the council is proposing to change the fee system, it is clear that the cinemas have long been accustomed to paying through this system and have probably set up uh, the administration to deal with that structure, thus contrary to the consideration of the council advice to change the whole fee system, we actually keep the system as is but modify the cost so that it's not too much of a transition to a whole new system between the Ministry of ECYS and the movie theater. Addressing the concern regarding the composition and of the cinema commission, uh, the secretary position as advised has been reinstated in the draft. Taking into account the advice, the position of chairman will also be reinstated, but the chairman will, will remain in service for a maximum of five years, just like other members. The council also proposed that the law determine how someone is, dis is dismissed. So this draft now includes a maximum term of five years for all members, including chairman and secretary, as recommended by the council of advice. And the provision is added that they can be both appointed and dismissed by national decree. The council also advises to ensure commission members are residents, so the draft has been modified to ensure that in Hazetana is part of the qualification criteria for being on the cinema commission. Addressing the concern regarding parental responsibility. The council is of the opinion that this law should still protect minors against harmful images. This is in line with the fact that there could be a connection with the task of the committee and article 2195 of the penal code. This law speaks of not seeing, not seeing of harmful images for children under the age of 16. While the council's position is clear and it is indeed important to protect children from harmful images, this law and the oversight committee, in our opinion, is not, no longer the only effective means for protecting children from harmful images. As noted earlier, kids today, unlike when this law was made in 1978, have many other ways to watch movies. The only effective way to protect citizens and children is through parental controls. This law is being modernized to place the emphasis and responsibility on parents. As the council indicated in 2015 in their advice, access to digital media is changing. Since that advice, 
It has changed even more as children can access potentially harmful media on social media such as TikTok, YouTube, Netflix, and more every second of the day. The cinema is a very small source of possible exposure to harmful actions within the meaning of Article 2195. Even if a child goes to the cinema for two hours a week, they are potentially exposed to multimedia for 166 other hours throughout the week. The only reliable tool to protect children, in our opinion, is parental responsibility and parental guidance, in line with the international standards for how this is normally regulated. For this reason, the, council, the council's advice has been seriously considered, but it's chosen to retain the responsibility for parental controls and leave the, the Article 18 amendment to the law unchanged, as was presented by MP Tamara Leonard. Mr. Chairman, I would like to thank you for the opportunity and thank the members of parliament for their attention and opportunity in this meeting. I look forward, being that this is a central committee meeting, to being able to get feedback comments, concerns, and um, I am available to the honorable members of parliament for any of the questions or comments that they have regarding this legislation. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Bryson. I look to my left if there are any members of parliament having any questions. I see MP Melissa Gums. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good morning to you, my colleagues, um, to the person in the Tribune with us, and to those listening online. Um, thank you for the presentation, um, MP Bryson, and the amendments to the cinema ordinance. I just, I just had one question, basically. Um, I understand the initiative to transfer responsibility for viewing to the parents, but if you could maybe explain a bit on, you know, Megaplex's right to also protect the viewing experience of their patrons. Um, for example, uh, I know that even the cinema does not really adhere to the ratings all the time. Um, I have sat in a horror movie with a toddler inside the horror movie with their parents. And between the boredom and horror and terror of the toddler, it was a terrible viewing experience for me as an age-appropriate patron at the cinema. So I just wanted to kind of ask, what is the, the yeah, what is the stopgap there for that? Because if Megaplex says, look, um, to protect the viewing experience of our patrons, we are not going to let you into this rated R movie with your 12-year-old or your 13-year-old. Um, you know, so I, just if you could expand a bit on how, how you took that into consideration then um, for this initiative. And that's it for me for now, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, MP Gums. I have... MP Duncan. MP Duncan, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A good morning to you. Good morning to all of my colleagues. A good morning to MP Bryson and those tuned in. Uh, kudos to you, MP Bryson, for uh, pretty small changes, but significant. I do agree with the update to the fees. We have so many ordinances that are in need of... Um, of modernization. So that I think is extremely important. Uh, when this topic came up and I saw the changes that were presented, I had to ask myself as a mother, um, going into the movie theater with my daughter for a movie that may be harmful to her, you know, do I have what it takes to be responsible? Yes. What my concern is, and I think this might also have to do with um, MP Gum's question, is on the, not only with on the cinema's end, but also when we look at the LBHAM and on government's end, what are those follow-up policies and procedures to ensure that indeed, if a movie is harmful, um, even if a parent is uh, attending with a child, what are the steps involved? How does the movie theater uh, confirm that the adult with the child is actually the parent? So for me, at the ground level, I would like to understand what actually happens. And then perhaps from there, we would say, hey, you know what, this would be a safe uh, change to the law. Um, but I see myself in the changes, and I think that um, they're necessary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Duncan. I see MP Sarah Westcott Williams. MP Sarah, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you once again to MP Rolanda Bryson. Thanks for your presentation, your 
draft initiative that you took over, as was aptly explained by yourself and by the chairperson, and uh, for presenting, a presenting it here this morning. Mr. Mr. Chairman, through you, one of, the, one of the general things that I lack also in the original draft amendment is the rationale, the, the, the rationale behind especially the change put in the, the responsibility with the parent. So the, the, you know, um, the initiative taker, MP Bryson, indicated that several discussions have been held you know, with different persons, different parties, and can, if any of those discussions included concrete information, concrete feedback, concrete data, for the lack of a better word, could those be shared? Mr. Chairman, and a big, a big if in front, to which I will come later, but um, if these changes were to go into effect, and the reason I say if, because my overarching question is the relevance of this law at this time. That's a, that's a question, you know, the, the relevance right now and the, the MP has explained, you know, where we where we got and where we are since 1978. Completely correct, and the evolution, as he referred to it in his um, presentation. So, um, I have I have the, some questions, but that's the overarching question: how the how the 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 MP, the initiative taker, looks at the relevance of a law controlling. Um, controlling the attendance at movies, um, how, how given the international rating as well, let me add that, and uh, which at the time, from the MP's own words, at the time of the law was in its infant stages. A lot has happened and it has been put out there by the MP in his presentation. So putting that as a sort of a, um, a if at the beginning, and then I want to know from the, if I just look at it, without taking that question into consideration, the question of relevance at this time, I would say definitely. If those are the fees we got, change, change them for sure. But when I say that, I ask because I saw the proposal or the advice by the Council of Advice to create a sort of a general fee system rather than the so much for this movie category, so much for that movie category. I also saw, which is the initiative taker's right, the, um, the response to that being no, the initiative taker prefers to stick with the, you know, this amount for this movie category, et cetera, et cetera. So I would like to understand, I am for the proposal by the Council of Advice to have a sort of a general fee. If we're going to stick to this law again, that's where my big if came in. But the um, but I would like to hear further from the initiative taker regarding their insistence, his insistence on remaining with the breakdown, like was shown on the on the screen. And if the initiative taker can, if he has that information, can give some insight, and this ties right into MP Duncan's question. And I had it under the 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 chapter, the paragraph, if you wish, of control and implementation. MP Duncan asks, how does it work on the ground level? And my question in terms of implementation comes down to that as well. How does it work on the ground level? And coming back to my if, if this law is, um, is relevant at this time, then I also have the question in the view of the initiative taker, whether or not the whole law deserves an overhaul at this time. I think it is. Again, if with the international rating system, et cetera, et cetera, um, social media, all of that, if it is still necessary for us to have a law such as this in place. The, I am, if the law is going to remain in place, I am totally in favor with the the changes regarding the composition and the terms, et cetera, of the, of the committee, but again, with a, big, um, with a big if there, and the if has to do with the, with the relevance at this time. Mr. Chairman, it is usually said that um, legislative action slash reaction is usually pushed by societal 
either pressure, demands, you know, um, wishes, and, and that's why my first question to the initiative taker, if he has some more feedback where that is concerned. Um, I, I might have missed it. I didn't see it according to me, but um, what have been some of the, the numbers if the initiative taker has been able to pull those up or to receive them in terms of the revenues, the, the, the revenues of the, um, of, of the fees that are, that are paid by, in this case, our only um, cinema that, that, that we have. So, um, Mr. Chairman, those are, those are my comments, so just let me um, emphasize, because sometimes what I say in here is taken totally out of context. I want to just re-emphasize my points, if that's okay with you. So the, um, the, the, the rationale, you know, of the, 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 the rationale behind moving to parental responsibility in the age of all of this evolution, um, financial, the financial paragraph, I am in agreement if this law is to go through the process that as it is, that the, the, fees, be in, the fees be increased, yes, that the composition of the, um, of the commission, that that be looked at and establishing terms, et cetera, that too can have my, um, can have my approval. Um, I am in favor of the, the, as proposed by the Council of Advice, for a more general fee structure rather than what was um, presented. And then, but I would like to hear from the initiative taker again, um, if right now the best avenue to deal with the parental um, responsibility, et cetera, is to change that old law. That's in essence where my question comes down to. And talking about parental responsibility, the Council of Advice was very, um, very specific on this matter in terms of um, no, because that responsibility exists already. And, um, but yet, the initiative taker, while admitting, giving due consideration to the proposal of the Council of Advice regarding parental responsibility, has decided not to change it. The Council of Advice is very strong on that particular point and um, has asked that I be given serious consideration. So I would also like to know a little further than what was presented, the initiative takers, um, view on that, on the matter of parental responsibility and specifically the advice from the Council of Advice and why it was decided, while it is a good point by the Council of Advice, the paraphrase, um, it's, you know, they, they, they're going to, the initiative take a wish to maintain what has been proposed in the, under the chapter of parental responsibility. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Westcott. The next person I see is MP Grisha Harlegal Martin. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, again. Um, thank you, MP Bryson, for your presentation. And first and, and most importantly, I'd like to thank uh, former MP Tamara Leonard for her initiation for in starting this um, in amendment. I just have two brief questions. Um, the initiator, through you, Mr. Chair, stated that he's sure that they will not be increasing the ticket fees once these fees are increased. However, this Caribbean Cinemas has a monopoly. How are we guaranteed that they won't increase the fees? It's, a, it's the only cinema on, in, in St. Martin. So what guarantee does the public have that the, they won't increase the fees? And how can we even try to stop that? And my second question is, maybe I missed it, maybe just some clarity on it. Um, if the initiator plans to um, move to the parental guidance, the standard standard uh, uh, ratings that, that, that is worldwide done, why maintain the, the um, committee? Why maintain the committee if we're going to move to that? Why not use the standard? Why not go how, do it how Aruba is doing it? Just They don't need a committee. They just stick to the, uh, the ratings. And then the, 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 theater, the theater would just say, no, based on PG-13, you, would come, you have to come in with parents. So why maintain the committee? Why continue that extra added cost? 
Um, is there any other responsibilities that the committee is supposed to continue doing? I, I, I don't understand why maintain that, unless they're there for something else. So if just some clarity on that, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I look forward to the answers. Thank you. Thank you, MP Grisha Heiliger Martin. The next person I see is MP Rayon Peterson. MP Peterson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A good afternoon to yourself. A good afternoon to my honorable colleague, MP Bryson. A good afternoon to the rest of my colleagues, to the Khrifir, to the Secretariat, to those in the Tribune, and to everybody else tuned in. Mr. Chairman, to you, <clears throat> I went over the law briefly. Um, and I had some some comments, you know, on the, on the technical side. I do, however, um, see the um, the division that came with this law, and therefore I also want to thank uh, um, former MP Tamara Leonard um, to go back into the law. And it's going to get a little bit technical, but I'm sure um, MP Bryson is going to keep up with me. <laughs> um, when we look at the original law, and then I'm looking at Article 14. It, it speaks on the amount of uh, members, and I saw that that one was changed um, in the new Article 14, and that is to be nine, uh, nine members. Um, I, I can see the sentiment in that, you know, a, to, too many members on a committee um, can make the decision making a little bit hectic. But what I would suggest is instead of putting the commission to start out uh, and then in, let's say just negen leden, try to make it um, a sort of a minimum and maximum like the original law because you don't want to risk, for example, if somebody on the committee passes away or they choose to resign, and then at that moment the committee does not um, um, consist of nine members and therefore it does not fall under uh, the regulation of the law which says that it needs to have nine members, you know? Um, so just a, a minimum and maximum to reach to that nine, uh, nine member committee. Um, that's just a comment from my side. And then uh, I also, when I look at the original law, it says that the committees are bundled by um which is um, logical. But in the new, in the in the wijziging, it says that they are bundled and ontslagen by landsbesluit. Um, I don't know why the ontslagen was put um, erbij. I get it, but I also think that maybe ontslagen is not a good word choice because you might be subjecting the firing of them to the same long process of a landsbesluit that ultimately depends on the governor to sign. You know, so, so you might be putting an extra criteria on, let's say, them leaving. I think that you can suffice with what you put in um, Article 16, which is that um, they are there for a maximum of five years and therefore um, automatically um, they would have to resign or they would have to just go um, instead of you know, subjecting them to the fact that, well, we're, we're going to stay until the governor um, gets to a law to actually fire us. And that's another comment I had, and then I go a little bit further. Um, in Article 14 itself, um, uh, another comment, technical uh, comment I had is that the secretaris, um, I don't understand why in Lit Bay it's with a, a capital letter, the S, and in Ledri, um, it, it's not. Those little things, you know, kind of make a difference because it gives the impression that the, secret the secretaris itself is, um, is a term that needs to be defined. And also in light of that, um, in Le Twe from Article 14, it says uh, the commission will start out on voorzitter als lid. So that's clear that the voorzitter is coming from the, the negen leden. Um, but in Lit Bay, it's, it only says on secretaris. Um, it does not specify that um, that one is a lit as well. And then in let's say it says negen leden. So it gives the impression that there are three different, um, let's say, positions, and with one of them being joint as, you know, the, the voorzitter als lid. And then in lid three it goes into um, the voorzitter, secretaris, and overige leden, worden bij landsbesluiten genoemd. And then in lid four only it says the voorzitter and secretaris wordt benoemd uit de leden. So if you look at lid twee and lid four, it kind of, um, it's missing um, some connection to, um, if you understand what I mean, because the, the voorzitter als lid is duidelijk, but then the, the secretaris met hoofdletter, um, that does not, um, it doesn't uh, explain if that's a member or not, and then only in lid four, it, uh, it comes up. So that, um, that was my other comment on that one, and then I'll look at article 18. Um, the last change that was, proposed, um, I would, um, when we say, um, at this on the ouders bijvoorbeeld, die voorzelf zijn van kinderen, beneden 18 jaar te, bes, uh, te beslissen, I would put uh, onder 18 jaar, 
om te beslissen. Zo, so, het is aan de ouders van de kinderen om te beslissen. Zo, so, de om is missing in that sense. En de beneden 18 jaar, I think um, onder um, 18 jaar is de uh, right term. And I think those are my, my comments for now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Peterson. I see now MP George Pantoflet. MP George, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon to the chair, my colleagues in parliament, or those that are viewing and those that are sitting in the tribune. Very interesting discussion, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just have three questions. Mr. Chairman, the, the, the whole issue of, of, should I use the word control? I don't know, do not know if that's the right word. Um, but before I go into that, uh, no mention was made as to the, the age limit of the members of the board. I know it mentioned five years and so on. You can sit on the board, but is there an age limit? You have to be a certain age and so on to where uh, you can continue being on the board, or is it you could be 100 years old and still on the board? That's, that's what I wanted to find out. And the issue of having access I mean, Mr. Chairman, honestly, there's a new um, link that I, I found. It's called Gujara 2, where you get movies. While they're playing in the movies, I can just type in Gujara 2, go to movies, type the name. There it is. So honestly, I, I'm trying to figure out, you know, what, <laughs> you can make whatever, whatever changes you want, Mr. Chairman. You're making another that name. All right, good. <laughs> what I'm saying, um, honestly, I, I'm trying to figure out, you know, one of the days we, we had, I know what we're attempting to do, but whew, uh, luck with that one. And um, finally, Mr. Chairman, does the amendment um, bring any additional finances into government's coffers? That's, that's what I need to know also. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP George. I see MP Peterson would like to take the floor. MP Peterson, you have the floor. Um, yes, Mr. Chairman, just um, two more small comments so, um, for Mr. Bryson to take with him. Um, in, so in the suggestion that I was making about the Article uh, 14 when it comes to the Leiden, um, a, an example could be uh, the Commission bestaat uit uh, negen Leiden, waaronder een voorzitter, een secretaris, en zeven gewone Leiden. So that would be a way to basically make that uh, distinction. And then um, the ontslagen, the, the comment that I made about uh, ontslagen, you can put instead of that something in the sense of uh, the, the leden treden off na verloop van hun benoemingsperiode, something like that. So just those two little comments I had to put in. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Peterson. I don't see any other member I would like to say, MP Bryson, a good presentation. Most of the points I agree, but I have one question. If I understood correctly, you mentioned parents can decide if they can allow their child to watch a movie. So for example, a class which is at the age where the parents have to decide whether they're going for a movie or not, so a class of 20 people, and some parents allow and some don't. What will be the effects after that in the classroom? And the chaos they will create. Have you paid attention to that? That'll be my only question so far. And before moving to MP Bryson, I just had a check on MP Grisha Halliger's question about the November 22nd telemeeting. I have the document here in front of me, UV slash 091 slash 2022-23, dated January 25th, 2023. Honorary Member of Parliament, herewith I confirm receipt of your letter dated November 7, 2022, of reference IS slash 169 slash 2022-23, requesting an urgent public meeting of parliament with agenda point one, the original SOAB report of 2021 on TELEM, two, update on the financial status and overall fiber to the home project, three, 
the state of affairs related to the concerns about the working environment at Telem, as expressed by the Telecommunication Union, reference IS 641-21-22. By means of this letter, I would like to bring the following to your attention. On January 12, 2023, under document IS 348-2022-23, Parliament received a copy of the SOAB audit done at the TELEM via the confidential route. Members of Parliament are free to pursue the document at the office of the Secretary General. Based on the above, I would like you, the requester <coughs> of this urgent public meeting, to indicate if after having pursued the confidential document regarding the SOAB audit done at Telem in September 2021, there will still be a need for this urgent public meeting. Sincerely, President Hassan Bijlani. I would like to give the floor to MP Bryson, if he's ready with his answers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, before going there, if I can ask MP Westcott Williams just to clarify one of her questions, um, Mr. Chairman, through you. Uh, MP Westcott Williams, through the Chairman, um, you had asked a question about concrete feedback and concrete data, and I wasn't quite sure um, maybe what, what, basically what she would like to get from me uh, in terms of that answer, if she can maybe clarify it, and then I can return with that answer. MP Sarah Vascott Williams, you thank, have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to MP Bryson for his question for clarification on it. Through you, Mr. Chairman, MP Bryson indicated that from where the, this draft law amendment started to when it was picked up by the by the faction, mm -hmm. that discussions were held with different persons. And what I want to understand because my question was also what is the what's the, the the rationale behind the law so I wanted to know if in any of these discussions more of the the actual situation so this is why we think we have to change the law I understand the updating part I understand the fees I understand the commission but specifically with where we now place the responsibility in the light of the international developments so I would like to know if there were stakeholders, for the lack of a better word, who chimed in on this draft and gave their, gave their position. And if so, I would just like to know, you know, what, what the feedback was. The MP indicated that he had spoken to some persons and got legal advice and that kind of thing. So yeah, in that context, my question. Thank you. Thank you, MP Sarah Westcott Williams. I hope that clears the point. And um, before you proceed, I see MP Grisha has a question. MP Grisha, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, indeed, you did send me a letter requesting if I should, would like to proceed with the um, meeting. But you mentioned, as you clearly mentioned yourself, there are three agenda points. That SWAB report only addresses one agenda point. So of course I would like to have the meeting. If you need me to respond in writing, I will, but it made absolutely no sense to me unless you could clarify it. Why would you ask me if I wanna continue a meeting based on a report that I need for a meeting? I received the report, I wanna discuss the report, and I wanna discuss the second agenda point and the third agenda point. It's an urgent meeting, so indeed, I would like to have that meeting, and I still look forward to that meeting. If you need me to put it in writing, I would do as such. But I, I would, it was not clear to me, Mr. Chairman, how you could ask me if I would like to have a meeting on a report that I requested to have a meeting on. So it wasn't clear. Maybe if you could clarify that. And if you need me to put it in writing, I will do so as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, MP Grisha. I will get back to you on that point. MP Bryson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I would like to really thank um, all the honorable members of parliament for your feedback, for your comments, your questions. Um, I think a lot of what has been stated is definitely some serious considerations that have already been taken into account that I would be happy to address. 
Um, but Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask if I can have an opportunity of maybe, I, I would need like 45 minutes to be able to answer questions and I would be able to continue today, but would be up to the chair and the members of parliament. Where do, up to you all. Just know that I'm ready. What is the indication? Are you all okay for 45 minutes? Yes, MP Westcott. Mr. Chairman, I, I would want to suggest that um, more than 45 minutes be given. And um, unfortunately, we have IPCO next week, so we're not going to be here. But I don't expect to stretch it out for the next two, three weeks. But um, at least as soon as possible, the meeting be called. We get our answers. So you get the reports, you know, and those things that are necessary for a central committee handling of a draft initiative law. Thank you. I'm most in agreement with that. MP Bryson, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And yes, um, if the members of parliament and U.S. chair allow me more time, um, absolutely, no problem with that. I did want, if, if you would permit me, Mr. Chairman, just to um, chime in on a couple things and something that uh, I think is also important, a, a general question that was asked um, about, let's say, the relevance of this law still. In analyzing this law and looking at other laws within the region, the kingdom, um, the United States, what I found as sort of a deficiency in our legal system is that unlike many jurisdictions, we don't have a specific law that caters directly to, let's say, the rights of a child and the responsibilities of parents that kind of illustrate what is harmful, what is not harmful, some of that type of guideline being able to, to be more specific as a general uh, thing, you know? We, we hear sometimes of, you know, I think in Parliament ourselves, we even talked about, you know, sexual harassment not being properly addressed in our legislation and so on. I think this law is still relevant for what it is intending to do. I think with this change, we will adjust it to more specifically um, kind of give a guideline for, for certain movies, a local guideline, because it will be a local group of professionals that can still uh, issue this. One of the comments I, I also have uh, from the LB Hum perspective is that uh, traditionally these uh, reports would be published. That hasn't really been happening, so that's something I think that the parliament would need to call on the government to make sure that these ratings are published. Make a Facebook page, a website where you get a local take on a certain movie being displayed. There's also a secondary function of the committee that is relevant, which is why um, I did not choose, and MP Leonard didn't choose to completely remove it either, because aside from the rating system, it is also um, a sort of protective measure that we might not hear about, but the committee can say uh, if a certain film, um, and, and this would apply mostly to documentaries. Let's say someone wants to view a blatantly racist or blatantly uh, um, anti-Semitic or whatever type of film, um, the com uh, especially documentaries that come out like that. We see um, some people getting in trouble for even sharing such things on social media. Um, the commission also has a sort of a, a responsibility to look at that aspect of a film as well, that it can't just be someone can go to the megaplex and put a, a, a blatantly racist or hugely offensive show to the society and use the, the theater to display it as propaganda or anything like that. So aside from the rating system, they still have that function. Um, from what I understand, there has been instances where um, such proposals were brought to broadcast certain films like that, and the committee stood up and said, no, this is not appropriate for the good moral um, function that they have to evaluate. So I think the committee still has its function, and that is why I wouldn't say let's scrap this law, um, let's modify it, and then let's look as a country into creating more specific laws related to the protection of children, et cetera. I would like to thank uh, especially MP Peterson for his uh, technical remarks. Um, definitely uh, something that we can do to, to make the adjustment in terms of the range and so on. I would ask the MP if maybe if you would even be willing to assist me in sending me a short email with some of those notes, because I did take some. Um, but I'm sure he can whip it up in a few minutes and help me out with that. I would really appreciate if he can do so. And for the rest of the questions, Mr. Chairman, whenever the parliament would like me to return, I will be here and make myself available to the members of parliament. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And once again, thanks to the honorable members of parliament. 
Thank you, MP Bryson. So with agreement, the meeting will be adjourned until further notice. And I wish everyone a good afternoon. Meeting adjourned.